Hello once again and welcome to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here every week with intriguing guests and topical issues and today we're going to meet one of my favorite people. Well, he's one of my favorite people and has been since I was 14 years old. <laughs> uh, I've known him. He's been a friend of mine that long. Uh, my former law partner, uh, Dean Andy Coates at the University of Oklahoma College of Law is going to be talking about, quite frankly, a very great milestone. Uh, this marks the 10th year of his deanship at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. We've entitled this show, uh, What a Difference a Decade Makes, because uh, this gentleman has made a difference uh, every place he has been, and it is not surprising that he has made that same kind of difference at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. A lot of changes, a lot of great things have happened, and a lot of great things are going to happen that he's, uh, he's fostering and mentoring. Yeah, no shortage of great topics with Andy. No, no, we can just pick whatever we want, and he can talk about it <laughs> with some uh, experience. We'll be right back. Andy Coates, the Dean of the OU Law School, today's guest on The Verdict. At Chesapeake Energy, here's a few of our favorite hornets. Alexis likes reading. Sam enjoys history. Alec loves math. Chesapeake is proud to support both the Oklahoma City NBA Hornets and the Young Hornets at Horace Mann Elementary, where over 150 Chesapeake employees mentor to children each week. The students gain a lot from the experience, but not as much as we do. Chesapeake Energy, committed to building a better Oklahoma. Hello, anybody home? Hi. Digital Max, welcome to the neighborhood. Hello, kid. Whoa, I haven't seen a digital tangle like that since... Yeah. You need Cox Connections. With one connection, you get the whole digital enchilada. Kind of like this. Wow. What are you waiting for? Get one connection to all your digital services from Cox. I think I pulled something. Your friend in the digital age. I don't see anything wrong in the education community suing the state. What is good for the state in the future of, do we give tax breaks now? The Democrats never asked that question for six years. <laughs> I don't want to use the word civil, but sometimes there's a little more methodical debate that takes place. It's more than just talk when you go inside the issues with Pat Hall and Jim Dunlap. Produced by Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce the guest. Very pleased once again uh, to welcome Andy Coates to our show, his third visit to The Verdict. Andy uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma and his law work there. He is now the dean of the uh, University of Oklahoma College of Law and the director of the Law Center, has been for the last 10 years. He's also been mayor of Oklahoma City, district attorney in Oklahoma County. Uh, it was a uh, uh, trial lawyer in Oklahoma City and the state of Oklahoma uh, with, uh, with much renown. He was the national president of the American College of Trial Lawyers, the first Oklahoman ever to hold that uh, position. And he's back again with us to talk about a decade worth of work at the OU College of Law. Andy, welcome back. Thank you. It's, uh, it has been 10 years. It doesn't seem like it. It's hard to imagine <laughs> that it's been 10 years, but uh, uh, I went down there in the summer of 96. and. Uh, it's been a, an interesting voyage. 
Um, Why did you decide to become the dean of the law school? You, you had done so many things prior to that. What appealed to you about this job? Well, several things, I think. First of all, I, I not only really loved the law school when I was there, but uh, I taught as an adjunct two or three mm -hmm. times down there, and I'd kept close to the law school over the years. And it had seemed to me that it had really fallen into some difficult times. Uh, and then David Bourne's very persuasive. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he talked me into becoming district attorney of Oklahoma County, which I did at a significant uh, uh, loss of income. And, uh, and then he came again this time. And, and, and the line he used was, Andy said, you know, you've got a great, great trial practice. He said, you get to try the biggest case in Oklahoma. And he said, you can keep on doing that and be very successful. Or he said, you can come down to the University of Oklahoma and have a positive impact on the lives of hundreds of young Oklahomans. And then he left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there I was, hooked. <laughs> and so I, I did. Yeah, and okay, I, so what did you find when you got there? Your first day, first week on the job, what, what was the, uh, the law school like then and what decisions did you make? I truly believe that the most difficult six months of my life, the most depressing and the most uh, scary uh, were the first six months that I was down there. Uh, the, the president of the university, Bourne, says, it, it laughs now, he wouldn't even return my phone calls for the first six months because <laughs> I was trying to figure out where I went to surrender. And uh, <laughs> uh, he uh, uh, wasn't interested in talking about that. Uh, the law school had, had really had some very difficult times. Uh, the building that it was in, uh, which wasn't the very best building anyway when it was built, uh, was really in, in terrible shape. The carpets hadn't been changed since 1976. That's 30 years. And there were places where water had accumulated and there were forms of life crawling out there that the botany or biology department couldn't even figure out what they were. They had visqueen uh, uh, over the shelves in the library because the roof leaked. The roof leaked not only when it rained, it saved up water. It leaked when it wasn't even raining, and, uh, <laughs> which was a bad deal. Uh, we had Anita Hill with us down there. She was a uh, obviously a very controversial a lightning rod and whatever side you came down on and people came down on definite sides of the uh, of the issues in which she was involved she was uh, made it really hard for us we had legislators who were introducing legislation to abolish the law school because she was there and uh, <laughs> just uh, all in all it was there i did find a faculty that was a very caring a very very bright and capable bunch so there was a lot of good things we still had lots of good students but the perceptions of the law school around the state were also a significant problem. Uh, they had recognized that things uh, weren't as they were. Oklahoma University College of Law has already dominated uh, legal circles in Oklahoma and, and in the region. It had been one of the fine law schools in America. And it no longer had that reputation. And uh, it was a matter of grave concern. And what concerned me was I didn't know how much ability I'd have to impact those problems. I mean, we needed money from every direction and resources are the constant battle in any uh, institution of higher education. So uh, when I got there and looked around and began to take inventory of where we were and what we have, it was depressing. Well, what do you find uh, were the major challenges besides the, uh, besides the uh, facilities that that you that you faced when you got there? Oh, I, I think uh, faculty, the size of the law school, first of all, they had, in order to, you know, the law school is funded by state funds they receive and by tuition the students pay. And so it was apparent over the years that if you had a lot more students, well, you increase your revenue stream. So we had, the law school was pretty big, there were almost 700 students. And uh, I didn't think that we were doing a good job with those students, as good as we could. And I didn't think that, uh, um, that the size, I thought the size was a, was a problem for us. And so it was too had, large. Just too large. And so, but the state regents are used to giving money uh, based on how many students you have. So that also affected not only the amount of tuition, but the amount of money they got us, uh, the regents. So I had to persuade them I wanted more money for fewer students, which was a pretty good selling job. And, uh, and that, was a, that was an extraordinary challenge, I thought, uh, coming down there. Obviously, faculty salaries were not what they should be. We were having a turnover uh, in faculty, and that's not a very good thing. You'd like to have a good... Uh, the time that you and I were there, Kent, while well, we had a pretty steady faculty, they stayed pretty much the same over the years, and there's a lot to be said for that kind of continuity. And, and the people that build an investment in Oklahoma that aren't just here to pay a couple of years and go somewhere else. So uh, building a, a strong base of faculty was, it was a, and the staff uh, required a lot of changing and a lot of work. Uh, and then, of course, the physical facilities, as I've mentioned, were just uh, uh, really a, a significant problem and a, and a problem that uh, impacted in so many ways uh, the way in which we 
uh, were able to perform our jobs to, to prepare uh, lawyers and judges and prosecutors uh, for the state of Oklahoma. I mean, and, and, and it's hard to do that when your facilities uh, uh, are not uh, anything like uh, sort of what they ought to be. Well, uh, cut me off if you need to, Mayor, but uh, it seems to me, uh, my memory is, that the first year you walked in there was also the year just uh, you, know, you received quite a wonderful honor of being uh, elected national president of the American College of Trial Lawyers, which is quite a prestigious offer, yeah. office. Uh, you had those two things going on at the same time, did you not? I really did, and, and I always have to distinguish. The American College is not the trial lawyers organization that you hear at the state right. and goes out to the plaintiffs. The, uh, the trial lawyers, the, the American College of Trial Lawyers, which uh, uh, Kent Myers is also a fellow, is the most selective uh, organization of trial lawyers in America. You have to practice 15 years, you have to be selected, and they go through a very rigorous uh, vetting to be sure that you're the kind of person who is honorable and honors your word and is an extraordinarily effective advocate. We're probably about 60 percent defense lawyers and about 40 percent uh, members of the plaintiff's bar. So it's an entirely or different organization. I always have to mention that because people think that I'd be out the legislature lobbying for tort reform or against tort reform or something, and that's not at all what the, what the American College does. But yeah, I did that, and as president, we would pack a bag on, uh, Linda and I would pack a bag on Wednesday night, and then we would uh, get up on Thursday morning and fly somewhere in the country uh, for a meeting with college fellows, and, and you do that for a year. We were in 47 states, I think, in a period of about, I'd done some when I was president-elect and, uh, and then some the year I was president. So it is a very, very time-consuming thing. So really, the first year, I was in the office really about three days a week, and uh, which was an extraordinary burden for everybody. I, I explained to everybody that that was what was going to happen when I went down there, so it wasn't a surprise. Nevertheless, they, there was complaints that I wasn't there enough. I mean, the sort of things you'd expect when you're not there enough. And so and I knew that better than anybody else that it wasn't there enough. But uh, we've got about a minute in this segment. Yeah. Talk us through historically, from the time that you're a student to now, how has law school changed? How is it different for the student? It, it has it has some of the great same things about it in the sense that uh, that it's very challenging, extraordinarily uh, difficult uh, first year, particularly uh, in in the kinds of studies you do. Uh, but th there have been significant changes. There are a lot more courses of various kinds, more specialized courses. Uh, there are more adjuncts. Uh, that, that is, an adjunct is a person who practices law full time but also teaches a course down there. And we try to take people who are in certain specialties to come and do that. There's a lot more of that going on than there was in, in the early days. And uh, I, I think making the students, um, our job is to educate and train. And, and always the balance is how much education do you do and how much training do you do. And I think we do a lot more training now than we did when, when I was in school or when Kent was in school. So there have been significant changes both on the academic side and on the side of the culture of the law school. And uh, I, think, I think we're better for it. I think we're, we're, we're a better educational uh, facility for our times, but uh, the times are different, so it's really hard to measure. Let me jump in here and get us to our first break. We're visiting with Andy Coates, the dean of the OU Law School. We'll be right back with more on The Verdict. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. R.S.M. McGladry. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. R.S.M. McGladry. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311. As someone who works in Oklahoma's oil and natural gas industry, I know how hard we're working to meet our current energy needs. But there are a few things all of us can do to reduce the amount of energy we use. Starting right around the house. Like installing a $20 programmable thermostat and turning it down. Because each degree above 68 can increase a bill by as much as 3%. It's amazing how putting a little effort in can keep a lot of energy from getting out. For more energy saving ideas, visit OERB.com. Hi, honey. You've got to check this out. What? What are we listening to? I had digital phone service installed today. It sounds just like before. I know, but it's going to save us a ton of money. With Cox Digital Telephone, you'll save big every month. Keep your same phone number and get your favorite calling features. Just pay less. 
That does sound good. You should hear the upstairs phone. The Cox Channel. More sports. More fans. More cheerleaders. More fun. Nobody does more local sports. And nobody does it better. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, and our guest, Dean Andy Coates of the OU Law School. Uh, Andy, when you and I were in school, we went to a school at a place called the Law Barn on the North Oval. It's an old uh, building with a couple of uh, uh, green owls. They were green because the engineers came over and painted them green all the time, which, which was a, a rivalry between the engineering school and the law school. And, the law school never just never did reciprocate. They didn't care <laughs> if the engineers wanted to paint them green. We didn't mind. Green owls are as good as any other kind. But we had a pretty old uh, building, uh, no facilities for the handicapped or anything like that. Without necessarily talking about today's law school, what, how important uh, to the law school and to the law student and to the university are the facilities in which the law school is housed? Well, the facilities are just a platform, but they really it's amazing how much where you work impact and, and the surroundings in which you work impact how you do what you do and how you feel about what you do. I had suggested to David Bourne before I got down there that it would be a wonderful thing to move the lawyers back to the Monette Hall in the old North Oval. And uh, uh, he thought that was a great idea. So when I first got there, the thought was we'd build a building just north of the North Oval. I had suggested that when I was sort of the token member of the first law center board. And I really didn't want to move. I wanted to stay there. And, and I spoke out. I guess rather vociferously against moving, and so they they didn't reappoint me to the board, and they moved without me. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, so that was the first possibility. I thought that'd be great, and that didn't work out for a number of reasons, mostly because you couldn't find place to put 600 cars a day back on the North Oval. So we were out there, and and I knew that at various levels that we really had, we didn't have any kind of an auditorium facility. The library was really a very mundane. We were used to having the great reading room like there was at Monette Hall. And so wanting to create that kind of environment uh, was what really caused us to move forward. And, and, but the impact of that and our ability to have enough classrooms so that we can have small classes is very important. Uh, and and uh, most of our classes are less than 50. And uh, that's quite extraordinary among law schools. Uh, I mean, the University of Texas Law School, uh, the entering class is bigger than our entire law school. And uh, I, I've wanted to make it smaller. And, and to, to do that, you have to have the facilities so that you can spread people out and get them in the right place. It is very important. Well, okay, now brag on your accomplishments a little bit. How are the facilities improved between 1995 when you got there and today? What, what's changed? Well, we've done total, a total redo. We, we've, the building, the existing building was 90,000 square feet on three floors. We added 80,000 square feet on two floors. So we got a 170,000 foot structure. We re redid everything from top to bottom. Um, and, and it gave us uh, not only the ability to go in and add new classrooms and seminar rooms of the of world class facilities, uh, but it, it gave us the chance to be somewhat more spread out in terms of everybody was crammed together, the staff well, was. Let, let's just look at some of the pictures. Okay, we, yeah, we've got sure. some pictures here, and sure. you can just kind of talk us through these. What are we well, looking at? That, that's the Bell Courtroom. Uh, it's uh, uh, on the very east end of our building. It is designed for both an auditorium, so that when we have outstanding speakers, but also for all kinds of legal proceedings. We have the Tenth Circuit, United States Court of Appeals, for the Tenth Circuit comes and sits and hears cases. The, uh, the Court of Criminal Appeals comes down there, the Court of Civil Appeals. We've tried actual jury cases there. It's got all of the bells and whistles in terms of computers and electronic uh, uh, devices of various kinds, uh, and monitors in front of the jurors. And, and then it's got rooms up at the back where a class can sit and watch a case being tried. Uh, and, and talk about it uh, without intruding into the proceedings. Yeah, they're glassed in rooms. Yeah, they call them skyboxes, but that's what they are at the back so that they <laughs> yeah. can do that. And they can hear the sidebar conferences between the judge and the lawyers and the jurors can. Hmm. Uh, when we have the uh, uh, hearings, we have put a big plasma screen so you can see the lawyer's face while he argues. And that's, that's a law student. We've got some of those down there. And uh, <laughs> they, we found places for them. That's in the side of the library, places where they're comfortable to study and study away from the 
uh, the main classrooms. The students now come and many of them stay all day. They used to come and leave. And I think the idea of bringing them back and bringing and keeping them in there to be part of the law school culture. That's the great reading room in the library. Uh, a lot of things are available elect electronically, but we still, so many things are still uh, and not anywhere besides books, and you have to do extraordinary research while you have to use the books. And so um, we, we are in the process of being sure we have all of the electronic databases, uh, but also all of the books that we need. That's uh, one of our larger classrooms. Uh, we have, uh, uh, that'll seat about 100, which is by far the largest classroom we have. We don't really have any, many very big, very large classrooms. And they've got all the same facilities built in. There's a little view of the east side of the building uh, that we have some places where students can wander around and do some outside uh, study. Uh, and, and, and on benches and things. Then, of course, that's the uh, uh, that's the south entrance, which is the main entrance around the fountain. Now, that building is named after you, is it not? It is, uh, and it was one of the, of course, great things that ever happened to me when they announced it on the day of the dedication. Uh, David Bourne said it was a um, it was an historic occasion for two reasons. That first of all, it was the first time they'd named a building for a sitting dean, and secondly, it was the only time in history Andy Coates had been speechless. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he was right, because I was. It was quite a thing. But yeah, that's, that's Andrew M. Coates Hall, and uh, the lights are shining, and I'm glad to see that they still are. Well, they will be, I know, for a long time. Let me ask you a little different question. Uh, law schools compete for, for law students, and uh, when you're in that search for what's the right law school for me, what are the objective measurements that a student will look at, and if you're uh, if you're a university president to try to evaluate how your law school's doing, or if you're a state bar president trying to evaluate how your law schools are doing, what are the objective measurements that are looked at? I think there really are three. Uh, we do a little mantra when we talk to people. There are three things that if you get in law school, and, and understand getting in is a challenge because we'll have 14 or 1500 applications for now about 170, 75 places. So it's a very, uh, it's a very tight fit. But assuming you get in, more than 90% will graduate more than 90% will pass the bar, and more than 90% will have uh, a position uh, within three months of graduation using their, their legal skills. So, and that's about as good as anybody in the country is doing. And uh, uh, I think students look at that, I think they look at class size. In the freshman class, the 1L class they call it, um, we divide the, the, the studies, the class up into groups of about 41 or two each for all of their major subjects. Most, most schools you'll go to will have 150 students or 200 students in, the, uh, in, in one class. And, and this way you've got 40 students in there, they, they become much more involved, they get called on a lot more, uh, they, uh, they really are, are, they buy into it a lot more. And so that's very important. For writing and research, which you and I understand is uh, one of the most important things we can teach uh, young lawyers, we do it in groups of 20. And we have four writing instructors that work full time with the students in that level. So size of classrooms and then ultimate results. I mean, how did they do on the bar exams? How did they do in their jobs? How did they do in terms of the numbers of graduations? I think are very important. The other thing we look at a little bit and try to do is we're really working hard on minority involvement. And last year we were 29% minority students. And that's again, was about as good as anybody in the country is doing. Certainly in a place like Norman, Oklahoma, it's a good place. And it's very important that we, that we have people of color coming to the law school and being involved in the law school and graduating and going out into the judicial system. Give us some names of o o OU Law School graduates that we might know. Well, Kent Myers, uh, <laughs> uh, William G. Paul, who was a recent president of the American Bar Association, uh, Ralph Thompson, uh, Lee West, Robert Henry, uh, Governor Brad Henry, uh, the uh, uh, Frank Keating, who was just governor. Uh, it's amazing how many people that uh, up and down the line, David Boren, uh, who is a uh, reasonably proud. Better not leave yes, him out. And I certainly will leave out Molly Boren, who is who's <laughs> great. So almost anywhere you go in Oklahoma, you run into a uh, a graduate uh, of the College of Law over the years. It's, it's, it's done some great things for us. Fred Harris, uh, Howard Edmondson uh, uh, have all been uh, graduates of the College of Law and it's a, it's a great thing because there's a great fellowship that's built up among people. My best friends over the years have been my classmates. Tom McDaniel, president of OCU, is a classmate of mine. And, and you're just amazing. You look around, and, and it's, 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 it's an extraordinary bunch. You've got about 30 seconds left. Give us your final shot in it. Well, what's the quality of uh, the law entering law student today as opposed to, heaven forbid, looking back when we entered? The difference is that it's very hard to get into law school. When we were there, if you were vertical and had 90 hours, you could get into law school. <laughs> and, uh, but they flunked out a lot. They flunked out about yeah. half the class or yeah. two-thirds of the class or something. And now, once you get in there, but it's, it, it's extraordinarily good students. The average class average will be about a 3.6-something uh, average. It's about, like hard, it's about as hard to get into law school now at OU as it was to get in medical school. 
and you, the kids know it now, so they really work hard, and they have to have done very well on the law school aptitude test. So it's, it's a test, but they're fine students. We are out of time. Dean Andy Coates, congratulations on the, the building that is named in your honor. You're Thank very you. deserving. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. for all you're doing to help Oklahoma be a better place. Yeah. Kent and I will have a final word when we get back. Good luck in your next. You're right. <laughs> comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. I know you guys said I'd save with Cox Digital Telephone. Well, my bill came and... Could this be right? You may be surprised how much you save with Cox Digital Telephone. That's why over a million and a half people have switched. So this really is a total. Lovely. Because I think I found a good use for the savings. With Cox, there's no waiting for the other shoe to drop. The only surprise is there's no surprise at all. Not sure where you're headed? NATS can help you find your way. It's the National Athletic Testing System. We call it NATS. You'll call it your launching pad to success. NATS will give you a standardized evaluation that will help you measure your performance and give that information to college coaches so they can accurately evaluate your potential. NATS also helps with academic support. Join with the Oklahoma High School Football Coaches Association and head for success at www.nats.us. Welcome back to The Verdict. Let me give you the website information for the University of Oklahoma School of Law, ou.edu. There it is, law.ou.edu. More information on Andy Coates and the fine school that he represents. Well, he's just done amazing things everywhere he's ever been since uh, from high school on and probably before that, but I can't vouch for that, but I can on high school after. Amazing individual, very articulate, one of the brightest people you'll ever be pleased to know, and I'm proud to call him a friend. We have some information on the web also about how you can get more information on this show, TheVerdict.TV. If you go to that website, you can give us an idea for a show that you'd like to see, a topic, a guest. Just let us know. Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time on The Verdict. The preceding program was produced by the Production Services Group at Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel.